Amen. Welcome to church this morning. How many of you are ready to worship the Lord this morning? What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Stand and worship Jesus.
worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can exceed that. Amen. Let's pray for these needs right here. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for, your, for the blessings of life that you bestow upon us each and every day. Father God, we thank you for delivering us, healing our bodies. Lord God, give us peace of mind and peace of heart, Lord God. These needs we brought before you today, Lord God, these that are battling cancer, these that need a special touch from you, Lord God, these that have lost loved ones. Father God, before we even ask that you know our needs and you're already working on their behalf. Father, I pray that a special anointing would be upon them, a special touch, Lord God, would be upon each and every one of them, Lord God, and they shall know that you're God. Father God, bless each and every person that's standing in this place today. These that are here, Lord God, I pray a special blessing upon them, Lord God. These that have needs that are that are not mentioned, Lord God. I, you know our needs before we ask, Lord. Touch them, Lord God. Minister to them, Lord. Bless them, Lord God. Father God, bless our service today, Lord God. May your spirit be poured out in just such a magic way, Lord God. That we will have no doubt to say it. Truly, truly, it was good to be in the presence of God. We thank you, Lord God, and we give you the utmost praise today. Amen.
God, you are so, so good to us. Can we just, can we just spend a moment waiting in this presence? Can we just lift our hands to God and let's just tell him out loud how good he is. God, we love you. God, we praise you. God, you are such a good, good God to us. You are such a good Father, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you. Thank you. Amen. Oh, you may be seated. And can we please show our wonderful worship team our appreciation this morning? We are so blessed here with such talent here at Sneeds Assembly, and not just that, with, but with people who are willing to share that talent, people who devote themselves and their time to practice and coming together to help lead us in worship and to prepare our hearts to receive the word, and I just appreciate them so much. Well, good morning. Good morning. Church family, can we welcome our visitors this morning? We thank y'all for coming, and please make sure you pick up a welcome gift at the uh, counter in the foyer on your way out if you haven't already. And I just I want to welcome all of you this morning, whether you're here in person or you're joining us on live stream or you're watching afterwards on our YouTube channel. Welcome to church, and I am so glad that you have joined us. For anyone who may not know me, my name is Jenna Johnson, and my husband, Ashley, and I, we lead the youth ministry here at Sneeds Assembly. So, of course, we would like to take this opportunity to invite any 6th to 12th graders not currently with us in youth services to join us in One Way Student Ministries. We meet every Wednesday. We serve dinner at 545, and we have service at 630. We get into God's Word, and we have church, much the same as you'll see here this morning, and we would love to have you. Speaking of this morning, I am truly honored to have been asked by Pastor Juno to fill in. He's away preaching a pastor appreciation this morning, and I know that he and Miss Amy are being a blessing to that pastor and congregation. So if you are a visitor with us today, please make sure that you do come back when pastor is in the pulpit. Don't make any judgments based on me. <laughs> if you do, you risk missing out on the most anointed pastor I've ever heard speak, so please make sure. Yes. So please make sure you do come back. And as for today, we're going to be talking about something that I could never achieve in my own power. And the Lord knows I did try. Boldness. Growing up, I always envied the kids who could be bold. They seemed to have so much fun everywhere they went. I'm not talking about the hooligans, mind you. <laughs> I just mean the kids that didn't get in their own way of having fun. I was so shy and so introverted that I wouldn't even participate in good, clean fun because I was terrified all the time. I've described it before as just walking around perpetually embarrassed. I didn't have anything to be embarrassed about, but that did not seem to matter. I would hold myself apart from my peers and my classmates, and I constantly felt inadequate in some way. I know there's some introverts here this morning who know exactly what I'm saying. So for me, the prospect of speaking publicly was laughable at best. I vividly remember times that the family video recorder would come out. Back then, you know, it was the big one that sat partially on your shoulder, made you look like you were part of a traveling news team. I hated that thing. Even in my own home, I was too embarrassed to speak while being recorded. I definitely encompassed the phrase, painfully shy. And it didn't completely go away. As I got older, I was better able to function with my peers than I was as a kid, certainly, but many of you here today, up until recently, still knew me as very quiet, or very quiet and reserved. I am the last person that you would expect to get up willingly and speak on a Sunday morning, but God. A few months ago at a women's ministry gathering, I was asked to pray. I did. And then one of the ladies came up to me afterward, and she said that she did not think that she had ever heard my voice before I spoke at my granny's funeral. And she's probably not exaggerating. That funeral was about 14 months ago. And God, 
was working hard on me at the time. He was calling me. He was calling the unequipped. He was calling the unlikely. He was calling the one who never, ever expected to receive a call. He was calling the one who hit her knees and said, God, me, not me. I'll help someone else. I'll happily serve behind the scenes. I'll make sure they have everything they need. I'll do whatever I can, God, but not me. He didn't listen to my pleas, and for that, I'm grateful. He's helped me begin to grow into the person that I always stopped myself from being out of fear, the person he had designed me to be the whole time. And I share that with you today because, one, if you're going to hear from me this morning, then I think you should have a little understanding of how I came to be standing here. And two, you may feel challenged in today's sermon. And I want you to understand that all I am here is a willing vessel. If the Holy Spirit begins working in you, pricking your heart as I share the message that I feel God gave me, I don't want you to think, well, it's easy for her to say. It's easy for her to do. No. No, it is not. Without God, I could never, ever be standing here in front of you today. I have acutely felt every single step of faith I have taken along the way, and it has not been easy, but it has been worth it, and I know that I still have a long, long way to go. So if you feel challenged today, please know that I am also being challenged, and we can step out and grow together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into today's message. Father God... I thank you today. I am humbled today. God, I ask you to be present in this service. I ask you to bless the people with ears to hear and hearts to understand and to receive your word. God, I ask that you anoint me to deliver this message in a way that glorifies you and blesses those that hear it. Move in this place, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our main scripture is in Acts 4, 23, 31. If you will please turn to your Bibles or in your Bibles to Acts 4, 23. That is Acts 4, 23. If you found your place, will you please say amen? In many Bibles, though not all, this scripture is subtitled in my Bible titles it, The Believers Pray for Boldness. Remember, boldness is our focus today, specifically spiritual boldness. And I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, but of course, Pastor Juno has our system set to King James Version, so there will be a little bit of difference. So in the ESV, it says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus... And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. If you'll notice, verse 23 jumps right into the action of the time. So to preface this passage of scripture, we need to back up to Acts chapter 3. And there we see that Peter and John, they were going to the temple to pray. And on their way, they saw a man who had been lame from birth. In other words, he was born disabled. 
This man could not walk and he could not provide for himself. So he was carried every day to the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Alms is money or food given to those in need, and the giving of alms was an important part of the Jewish faith, so beggars would have found it profitable to be near the temple. In short, begging was this man's way of life. It was how he survived. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Both Peter and John, they stopped and they looked at the man, and Peter said to him, look at us. So the man looked at them, probably expecting that he was going to receive something of monetary value. So imagine his surprise when Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Scripture tells us that immediately the man's feet and ankles were made strong and he leapt up and he walked into the temple with them. Not only was he walking, but he was leaping and he was praising God excitedly. People started to recognize him as the man who always sat begging by the beautiful gate, the man who had to be carried to the gate. And now he was walking and leaping for joy and praising God. People were filled with wonder and amazement and they ran up to the trio. They wanted to know what had happened. So Peter addressed the crowd. He said, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Then Peter tells them that it was God by faith in Jesus that made the man walk. And then Peter starts preaching. He starts having church right then and there. There was some rebuke, but it was a sermon, no doubt. But he made his answer to their questions clear. It was by the name of Jesus that this man was healed. Now we're entering into Acts chapter 4. So as this speaking was taking place, Scripture tells us that the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, they came up to them greatly annoyed because Peter and John were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They didn't like that. So they arrested Peter and John and they put them into custody until the next day. So on the next day, Peter and John came before the council in Jerusalem, and they were asked this question. By what power or by what name did you do this? They were referring to the healing of the lame man. The scripture tells us that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that. Then he answered them, rulers of the people and elders. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man... By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. He said, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there was no other name under heaven given among men by, by which we must be saved. So the very next verse, verse 13, reads, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Now, before Peter's reply, Scripture tells us that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And after his reply, the observation that the council made was Peter and John's boldness. And they were astonished. These men weren't supposed to be bold. Scripture tells us they were uneducated. They were common. So how could they be so bold? I'll tell you how, because the rest of verse 13 says this. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The council recognized that they had been with Jesus. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. The council couldn't believe the boldness of these two uneducated common men, but they knew they had been with Jesus. Hallelujah! Can people see the Jesus in you, friends? Because that is the goal. You walk with Jesus so closely that when your spiritual boldness is questioned, they cannot explain it with earthly reasoning, but they recognize that you have been with Jesus. Now that will preach right there, but I have to keep moving, y'all. I'm not even back to our main scripture yet. 
So the council, they question Peter and John's boldness. They recognize that they had been with Jesus. That's enough of an answer for me, but these so-called wise men on the council, they still had punishment on their brains. But when they saw the healed man sitting next to Peter and John, Scripture tells us they were at a loss. They had nothing to say, but they had to do something because they didn't want this foolish notion of Jesus worshiping to continue. So they told Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Then Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They cannot but speak of what they have seen and heard because when you've been with Jesus, you are changed. You can't help it. They had a Holy Spirit-driven desire to proclaim the message of Christ. We need to get us some of that. So at that statement of Peter and John, the council threatened some more. But they couldn't actually punish them at that time because Scripture tells us the people were there praising God for the healing that had happened. And the council didn't want to upset the people. There's probably a civics lesson there, but we're just going to keep moving. And that brings us to Acts chapter 4, 23 to 31, which is our scripture passage for today. And it will now flow much better now that we've talked through what had happened just prior. Remember I said earlier that this passage of scripture is titled, The Believers Pray for Boldness. And in my mind, this passage can be broken up into three parts. What happened before the prayer, the prayer, and what happened after the prayer. Verse 23 is what happened before the prayer, and it reads, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. So Peter and John had just spent the night in jail for healing a man in Jesus' name. They went boldly before the council. Had it not been for the people who were there praising God for the healing, they certainly would have been punished. As it was, they were threatened. They were told not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And I'm sure they were feeling many different emotions. Wonder and gratefulness that the man was healed, thankful to have been found useful in the kingdom of God, perhaps a bit scared that they had been arrested, relieved that they had each other through the ordeal, shaken to have had to go before the council, thankful that the Holy Spirit had enabled them to speak boldly, tired from the excitement of the whole thing, thrilled that they were able to walk away unscathed, nervous for what was likely to come, since they knew they were not going to stop teaching and preaching Jesus. So after all that, what's the very first thing that they did? Verse 23 says, When they were released, they went to their friends. They went to their friends. I know the scripture uses the word friends here, but this is the early church they're referring to, who were also their friends. I've summarized this into one word, walk. We need like-minded people to walk with. Life is not easy. We live in a fallen world of sin and sickness. There are mountains to move and valleys to endure. Because of that, we need this. We need congregation. We need church. We need family. We need unity where we can find godly support and love. If you are at home watching and your health will allow it, come back. We need you. And you need us. And those of you who are here might be thinking, Jenna, you're preaching to the choir. We're sitting right here in the pews, and you're right. You're right where you need to be. But please, please make sure that you are not just coming here to sit in the pews, to tick the church box off for the week. This is not about taking attendance. We cannot just come and sit on Sundays. We have to get connected so we have companions to walk with. Peter and John, they went straight to their friends, to the church, who they walk with and who walks with them. We need that. To paraphrase Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. God said in Genesis 2 that it is not good that man should be alone, and I understand the context of that verse is referring to a spouse, but I believe the statement stands in today's message as well. 
Do not underestimate the importance of church. You need people to walk with. We have all experienced heartache. We've dealt with life's disappointments. We've lost loved ones. We've been hurt. We needed people to help us pick up the pieces. Sometimes, sometimes, you just need God with skin on. You need people to walk with. So I said that our main scripture passage is broken up into three parts. The first part is what happened before the prayer. Peter and John went to their friends, the church. We summarize that with the word walk. The second part is the prayer. Let's look at that. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers who were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is incredible. Peter and John had just come in from the trenches, so to speak. They told their friends what had happened. And the scripture says when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Just like that. They lifted their voices together to God. Can we honestly say that that's our first response to strife and trouble? Because it has to be. And I know it's hard because we get ourselves in a place of self-sufficiency. We think we can fix our own troubles. We are so blessed that at times it's a curse because our prosperity has taught us just how much we can do for ourselves and then we lose touch with our reliance on God. Can I encourage you to give it to God first? Then, after you've waited in his presence, then you can use the provisions that he has blessed you with to sort it out if that's possible. But don't let your earthly wealth distract you from your heavenly prize. Do Do as Peter, John, and the church demonstrated here. Give it to God first. And if he has blessed you with the provisions to alleviate a problem, give him the praise. Dr. R.A. Torrey said, pray for great things. Expect great things. Work for great things. But above all, pray. So the church begins their prayer, and they start by praising God and proclaiming his greatness by saying, He made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They're worshiping God here. They're magnifying him. When we go to God with our troubles, it's good to remind ourselves just how big and powerful he is. Our troubles, as huge as they may be, they're earthly troubles, and we serve a heavenly God. Magnifying God helps us to keep the correct perspective. And then they went on to say that God, through David, by the Holy Spirit, had said the following. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're quoting Psalm 2 here, written by David. This psalm is speaking about people and leaders taking a stand against God's anointed, in other words, Jesus. During my study for today, I read a commentary that said, This psalm presents a sad picture of humankind's arrogant rebellion against God, his law, his plan to save them, his Messiah, and the moral teaching of his word. And that's exactly what Peter and John had just experienced. They had been arrested and threatened for speaking the word of God. So it makes sense that they would repeat this psalm. 
in their prayer. Continuing on, they prayed, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy, holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They are echoing Psalm 2 again, pointing out the New Testament rejection of Jesus in Jerusalem. But they're saying more than that. If you look closely, they say to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. As awful as the people were, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. So the events were never outside of God's control and power. And they are stating that they know that here in their prayer. And then their prayer takes a turn. They praised God first. Then they stated what was going on, what the problem was. And now they're going to bring their request. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. These believers are praying for boldness. They said to God, see their threats to us and then grant to us the ability to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And I want you to notice the word continue in the text. They ask God to grant them the ability to continue to speak his word with all boldness. So they already were. We know that they were initially baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. We read in Acts 3 that Peter and John were able to heal in Jesus' name. And then earlier in Acts 4, the scripture states that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke boldly, and also that the council observed the boldness of Peter and John. So they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. They had been speaking boldly. But they prayed a very powerful, a very earnest prayer, asking for renewed courage to testify and speak for Christ. They were praying for renewed boldness, greater boldness to meet the tasks at hand. There is a quote by Phillips Brooks that I think applies here. He says, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. That's the way these early Christians were praying, and that's how I believe we should be praying today, boldly. Our world is a difficult place to be. Speaking biblical truth is not easy. We are being shamed into silence. We're being told that we're bigots and unsympathetic, and we want to minister in love as Jesus did. So oftentimes, when faced with such angry opposition, it's easier to just sit down and be quiet. But as we watch our world spin out of control, may I submit to you that we need to be praying for boldness as the early church did. That we need to be saying, God, look upon this fallen, wretched place, this place where we're told biblical truth is the opposite of love, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. Verse 30 completes the last sentence of their prayer. It says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Verse 30. While you stretch out your hands to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When you are praying boldly, believe for wonders. There's a lot that happened in this second part of our scripture, their prayer. I'm going to summarize it with the word wonders. Because I think that that word helps to remind us to believe for greater things, to ask for greater things. Not just, God, help me get by. God, help me to survive. I know that we're in the depths of our brokenness. We feel that's all we can utter or think, but I encourage you to step out in spiritual boldness and pray, God, embolden me to thrive, to live out your plan for my life with strength and power, expecting wonders. God, please enable me to speak your word boldly in Jesus' precious name. Pray boldly, church. So the first section was what happened before the prayer. And we summarized that with the word walk. We said we need people to walk with and we need to be willing to walk with others. We need church. 
The second section was the prayer for boldness, and we summarized that with the word wonders. As Philip Brooks said, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. As the early church did, pray for the ability to speak God's word with all boldness, believing for wonders in Jesus' name. Now we're moving on to the third section, and that is what happened after the prayer for boldness. Verse 31 Excuse me, verse 31 reads, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Acts 2, Pentecost, gets a great deal of attention, and rightly so. It's the amazing fulfillment of Jesus' promise and God's magnificent plan. I love it. But this verse we've just read, it gives me chills. It says the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This verse is powerful because it tells me that there is work to do. We have work to do. Just two chapters prior, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But the unbelieving world is hard. They were in the trenches. They were speaking and continuing to speak God's word with boldness. And they had to have the Holy Spirit to do that. They could not do it in their own power. They needed the Holy Spirit, and they needed the Holy Spirit again. May I submit to you that we are the very same here this morning. We need the Holy Spirit, and we need the Holy Spirit again because we have work to do. Scripture tells us, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them of the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You cannot do that in your own power, friend. You need spiritual boldness. You need the Holy Spirit, and you need the Holy Spirit again and again. Continue to pray for boldness. Continue to seek and believe and speak the word of God boldly. The first section was what happened before the prayer, and we summarize that with the word walk. We need people to walk with, and we need to be willing to walk with others. We need church. The second section was the prayer for boldness, and we summarize that with the word wonders. As Philip Brooks said, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. As the early church did, pray for the ability to speak God's word with all boldness, believing for wonders in Jesus' name. The third and final section was what happened after the prayer. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And I summarized that with the word walk. They needed the infilling of the Holy Spirit again to empower them to do their work. And we have the very same work to do today. We are under the same commission to go and make disciples. We have work to do. If you don't remember anything else I said today, remember Acts 4, 23 through 31, walk wonders work i'm closing now miss vanessa if you will please pray play you can pray too if you want to <laughs> when i think back to the timid girl i described to you at the beginning i know with certainty that it took the holy spirit to get me to this point standing here before you boldly proclaiming the word of God. This is not me. This is not my own power. I've turned to God more than once, many times, and called out asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. I needed it again this morning, and I will probably need it again tomorrow. I most frequently say, I just, I get still and I say, God, more of you and less of me. John 3.30 reads, He must increase. I must decrease. I tell you that because with all this talk of boldness, I don't want it to be misunderstood that I mean arrogance. Hear me on this. There is no room for arrogance in humbled submission. Peter and John were not being arrogant. Peter was quick to stop any claims that they healed the man of their own power. The church wasn't being arrogant in their prayers for boldness, just the opposite. They knew they had to turn to God. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, because they couldn't do it on their own. 
crying out to God and asking for his help is admitting that you cannot do it on your own. Arrogance is not biblical. Arrogance and boasting is warned against throughout the Bible. So please understand this. The boldness that I've been referencing all morning is not my own and it is not yours. But you can pray and ask for spiritual boldness. You can boldly pray. You can make bold requests. When I think about bold requests, I think about one of my very favorite biblical accounts is found in 2 Kings 2. Just before Elijah ascended into heaven, he said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He did not just ask for Elijah's spirit to be upon him. He asked for a double portion. Elijah was mightily endowed with the Holy Spirit, and Elisha realized he could never follow in Elijah's steps in his own strength. When Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, he was asking boldly, but it was from a place of humbleness because he knew he needed the spiritual power beyond his own capabilities. Elisha did not ask for tasks equal to his powers. He asked for powers equal to his tasks. He asked boldly for a double portion. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find grace to help us in time of need. I want you to notice one last thing before I close, and that is the sense of unity in the early church. Our scripture tells us that they lifted their voices together to God. Another translation says they raised their voice to God with one accord. I know we normally don't look around in church. It's considered rude. But I want you to look around you. I want you to see who's sitting to your left and to your right. Who's in front of you? Go ahead. It's okay. I won't tell Juno. Who's behind you? Who's in the front? Who's across the sanctuary? These are your people. This is your church. This is your community. These are the people who will walk with you in your difficult times. And these are the people you will walk with through their difficult times. You should be able to call on any one of these people for confidential, heartfelt prayer, and they should be able to call on you for the same. We are on the same team here. We are part of the church. We are part of the body of Christ. And we are living in perilous times, a time where we need one another. If you will, please stand. I'm going to open altar in just a moment, but I'm going to do things just a little bit different, so please be patient with me. Salvation is too important to skim over, and I want to give appropriate time to it. If anyone here is not saved, if you cannot answer with certainty that if you were to die today on the way home that you would go to heaven, I want you to have that certainty. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever that you should walk through those doors without the ultimate peace in your heart. Scripture tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If anyone here would like to come to the altar to claim your free gift of salvation, please come right now. We are not going to embarrass you, and you won't be alone if you come. I have someone to pray with you. Saints, be interceding, please. I preached on spiritual boldness today. But if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then this is your first step to spiritual boldness. Maybe... Maybe you were saved at one time, but life happened and you slipped away from your relationship with God. There is not one person in this room that would judge you for that. We don't come to church because we're perfect. We come to church because we're works in progress. Come now if you would like to uh, pray for salvation. I'm going to give that just another moment. Please don't be embarrassed or ashamed. 
There is no shame here. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. God, I ask you, Lord, just to be with them, Lord. I ask you to give them boldness, Lord. I ask you to give them boldness. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, as a church, with one accord, I would like for us to come to the front and pray as the early church did in our scripture today. They lifted their voices together to God. We need spiritual boldness. We need it like we need air to breathe. And we're all at different stages of life. We're dealing with different things. So spiritual boldness will help serve us in different ways as we serve the kingdom. You may be struggling with your belief. You may be struggling with your purpose. Maybe you've, worked with, you've walked with God for a long time, but the years have brought difficulty and your fire has dimmed. Maybe you're somewhere in the middle. You have no real troubles to speak of, but you don't have a real zeal for God either. But you call yourself a Christian, and you know you could do more for the kingdom of God if only you had a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. If only you had a heavenly boldness about you. But the one thing, the bottom line, is that we need to be able to speak the word of God with boldness. Who's going to tell the world if not us? I want us all as, as one church in one accord, as the early church was, to please come up from together in unity and pray for spiritual boldness. Boldly ask God for what you need in Jesus' name. Please come.